Welcome to a recorded webinar uh, hosted by uh, the Rural Advancement Foundation International um, and North Carolina State University and North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Uh, my name is James Robinson. I work for the Rural Advancement Foundation International um, and I'm joined by uh, Ted Fitzhands. And I'm Ted Fitzhands in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at North Carolina State University. I'm an extension professor and I'm also a licensed attorney, although I will not be giving legal advice on this uh, webinar. Uh, Ted, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're going we're gonna to each give a presentation today. Um, it's going to start uh, with uh, a presentation that I will give. Um, on oil and gas leasing in North Carolina. Uh, and this is going to cover the recent history of, of leasing in North Carolina as well as some of the rules and regulations that landowners should be aware of as they uh, think about how um, uh, leasing may play into um, decisions that they make about their, their property in North Carolina. So let's start off with a little history about RAFI. Um, RAFI uh, again stands for the Rural Advancement Foundation International. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, and we've been around uh, working with farmers in the southeast um, primarily since about the 1930s. We've been through several different incarnations as an organization, but were incorporated as RAFI uh, in 1990. Um, we focus on uh, several areas of work that impact rural communities, uh, one of those being uh, fairness in contracts, uh, including mineral and oil and gas contracts and, and general agricultural contracts. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, I'm going to split my presentation into five sections. I'm going to give a, uh, an overview of hydraulic fracturing that will be very brief, and I'm going to cover some of the recent history uh, in, in North Carolina's oil and gas leasing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about split estates and forced pooling. Um, those are uh, outstanding issues that uh, are unresolved in, in, uh, in some ways in North Carolina, um, and Ted will talk even more in depth about those issues. Um, and then we'll review some of the legislative and regulatory changes that will impact uh, landowners and, and uh, the decisions that they have to make uh, around uh, oil and gas uh, leasing issues. Uh, and then I will briefly touch on how um, you as an, as an interested citizen could be uh, involved in, in this issue. So hydraulic fracturing. Um, many North Carolinians are familiar with this issue now. Um, it's been debated um, uh, within the state um, and among the elected officials um, of the state for uh, several years now. Uh, but it is essentially the process of extracting natural gas from shale rock. Um, and that process involves pumping water and chemicals and sand at very high pressure um, thousands of feet below the surface um, uh, into shale rock and cracking that shale rock open. Um, and then the, the sand uh, that's a part of that mixture that's pumped into the ground essentially holds those fractures open so that natural gas can escape to the surface um, and uh, uh, be extracted uh, in that manner. And that's, that's just very generally uh, sort of what we're talking about when we say hydraulic fracturing. That's, that's the very, very general overview of, of the process that's involved. So North Carolina's show gas basin is, is where we think, um, given the information that we have now, hydraulic fracturing would be most likely to take place. This is where we think there is um, the highest likelihood of economically viable natural gas. Um, this map that you're looking at now was provided by the North Carolina State Geologist's Office, and uh, the green areas on the map there are North Carolina's uh, fall into North Carolina's Triassic Basin. And you can see that it runs through some uh, uh, population centers uh, in Wake and Durham counties, uh, a little bit in Orange County and Chatham County, and some rural areas in, in Lee County and Moore County. Um, you'll also see some areas in Rockingham and Stokes County um, that are a part of the, the Triassic Basins in North Carolina. So let's talk a little bit about leasing. There's been some leasing that's, that's gone on over the last few years within the Triassic Basin, and um, let's, let's talk about that and I'll get up to speed on, on what the history of that leasing is. Um, that map indicated uh, between 14 and 20 counties where uh, fracking could take place in North Carolina. 
And that number may be uh, altered or shifted up or down uh, depending on uh, better information that we receive in the future. But, but right now, based on the information that we have, it's, it's 14 to 20 counties that we think are, are, are most likely to be impacted uh, by fracking were it to happen. Um, gas companies have certainly focused on Lee County. Um, this has been the area of, of uh, highest interest and, and the peak of that interest was probably close to about five years ago. Um, the companies uh, that were active in North Carolina have been active since 2006. Um, in Lee County, there were 80 leases signed um, during the peak of this leasing uh, that covered a little over 9,300 acres. And the bulk of that leasing was done by the Whitmore Exploration Company. Um, uh, and that company has since allowed a little over 3,600 of those acres uh, that were leased to lapse, and that happened in 2014. Uh, so we're left with a, uh, roughly two-thirds of the uh, original area that was leased uh, in Lee County. So that's just a brief overview of some of the leasing that's gone on in North Carolina, oil and gas leasing. Um, predatory leasing. Sounds, sounds pretty serious, and, and, and really it is. Um, my organization, RAFI, was asked to um, uh, get involved in this issue when it was suspected that some uh, landowners in North Carolina were being offered uh, what we would characterize as predatory leases. Um, we would characterize them in that way because uh, the bonus payments uh, that were being offered to landowners uh, per acre were between $1 and $20. Um, whereas in other states we've seen bonus payments as high as twenty thousand, um, that's probably the upper ceiling of the bonus payments that you would see in other states. But it, it, it um, illustrates the point that if you wait to sign a lease until there's really good information about how much natural gas is um, is in the ground below your property, and there's a high demand for that natural gas, that you can get a real premium. Uh, price for it um, in terms of, of bonus payments. And North Carolina landowners, because of our lack of information and, and lack of, um, of real demand for that natural gas at this point, we're receiving very, very low bonus payments. Um, the royalty payments that were offered in those leases in Lee County um, generally offered the minimum royalty payment, which is 12.5%. And then there were unreasonably long drilling phases. Um, the typical drilling phase is between three and five years. The leases that we saw were being um, uh, offered at 15 to 20 years. And it's a problem for a landowner if you want to make long-term plans for your land that don't involve oil and gas drilling. A 15 to 20 year lease really ties up your land and the possibility of leasing for a very long time, which is to a landowner's disadvantage. Um, and then there were a few other uh, uh, landowner protections that limited the financial risk and legal liabilities for those landowners. And we're going to jump right into to what some of those um, additional protections might have been. So in 2012, after um, uh, most of this leasing took place in the county, uh, the General Assembly um, passed uh, some legislation that required certain oil and gas lease terms um, and essentially said, you know, these need to be in place in order to maintain fair practices within this industry. So, for example, the General Assembly said that companies must provide educational materials from the Department of Justice prior to executing a lease. Um, the maximum 10-year uh, duration of a lease uh, would be required um, unless oil or gas is being actively produced at the end of 10 years. Um, that that minimum royalty payment of 12.5% would go into law, that companies could not offer lower than that. Uh, and that bonus payments uh, had to be paid within 60 days of a lease execution. Um, in addition, uh, it, the General Assembly said that leases shall provide for compensation if water is to be used from the property, uh, that leases must provide that um, an operator will pay reasonable costs of water testing within one half mile radius um, of a wellhead. Uh, this is an important one to remember. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it later because that has changed since this legislation was passed in 2012. Um, there would be a notice of assignment required. Uh, that means that if a company that uh, originally leased your oil and gas rights from you sells that lease to another company, they must notify you of that sale. And uh, it also required that uh, within a lease, companies recommend that you receive approval from your lender before signing the lease. 
um, signing a lease without getting uh, approval from your mortgage lender could uh, potentially be problematic. We'll talk some about why that might be the case. Um, and then the General Assembly finally uh, put into place a seven-day right of rescission. So it allowed for landowners to uh, essentially void a lease within seven days of signing it. Um, if they you know, realized with additional information later on that maybe that wasn't the right decision for them or if perhaps someone in the family was coerced into signing something when it, it probably shouldn't have been their decision to make. Um, so that's, uh, those are some of the things that were put in place after this initial predatory leasing that took place prior to 2012. So mineral rights leasing post-2012. Let's talk a little bit about what's happened since um, the General Assembly enacted some of those minimum lease standards. Um, so in 2014, a company called Crimson Holdings began offering leases in Durham and Orange counties. Uh, and these leases were um, uh, in violation of almost every statutorily required lease term. So all of those terms that we just went through that were put in place to protect landowners, uh, Crimson Holdings offered leases that violated almost every single one of them. I believe the only one that they didn't violate was the uh, minimum royalty uh, payment of 12.5%. As a result, the North Carolina um, uh, Attorney General sent Crimson Holdings a cease and desist order. And the general takeaway from, from providing this information is to let landowners know in North Carolina that there are bad actors out there that will try and take advantage of you. So it's very good to um, know what protections are in the law that are meant to protect you. It's very good to have an attorney that you trust to help you understand and negotiate um, as, you, as you navigate the oil and gas leasing process. So let's talk a little bit about split estates and, uh, and forced pooling now. These are a couple of the unresolved issues uh, left uh, on the table uh, related to hydraulic fracturing. So first, split estates. And Ted will go a little bit more in depth into this, and so I'll give just an overview and sort of this uh, diagram here um, describe itself a bit. Um, but in the case of landowner A that you see there on the left, um, that landowner owns what we would call a unified estate. Uh, the landowner owns both the surface of the property and the subsurface of the property, um, essentially in theory to the center of the earth. Um, landowner B is in a bit of a different situation. Uh, landowner B just owns the surface of the property, uh, whereas the mineral estate, um, you could call them landowner C, owns the, um, the entire mineral estate of the property. So decisions that would be made about the mineral estate are going to be made by a different landowner than decisions about the surface estate. And that can create some conflict um, when we start talking about um, natural gas drilling. So what are some of the problems with split estates? Um, well, owners of the surface property, um, as I've stated, do not own the subsurface of the property. Uh, in Lee County, there are about 365 parcels uh, the size of 12 square miles uh, that are split estates. And this was a tabulation of uh, Lee County data that the News and Observer uh, put together. Um, we also have limited information about how mineral, mineral, oil, and gas development will impact property value. And so as a landowner uh, that owns the surface of a split estate, you have little ability to control, um, little to no ability to control what happens to the estate in terms of oil and gas development. And since we don't know how that impacts property value, um, there is sort of a very large variable impacting your property value that you as a landowner have no control over. Um, and that can be very problematic. Um, and as a result of, of, of such a problem, uh, the State Employees Credit Union stated that they will not offer financing on its split estates um, and property with uh, mineral rights leases. Um, and that's an indication of the lack of information around how oil and gas development may impact property values. That's the State Employees Credit Union saying, we have to protect ourselves because we don't have enough information about how this activity will impact the value of a property that we uh, uh, have an interest in. So let's turn to uh, forced pooling. Uh, this is known as compulsory pooling in North Carolina. 
and it's used to create a drilling unit by forcing non-consenting landowners into participating in a proposed drilling unit. This is currently legal in North Carolina and has been legal since 1945. Um, however, nothing in this law that legalizes forced pooling indicates how or when uh, forced pooling can be used. Um, and this creates some problems. Uh, in most states, um, forced pooling can only be done after uh, a certain percentage of uh, the acreage or a certain percentage of the landowners within a proposed drilling unit have voluntarily leased. Um, that threshold uh, varies uh, significantly across states. It can be you know, as low as um, uh, a percentage in the single digits have to fall voluntarily lease, and it can be as high as 90% have to voluntarily lease. But in North Carolina, we, we don't specify how, how many, so it's a big outstanding question. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what force pooling looks like and, and the history of force pooling. Um, so force pooling in, in 1945, when, when this law was put on the books, would have looked a little more like this diagram that's on the screen right now. Uh, landowner A uh, would have uh, put a well on the ground uh, to uh, extract oil from a free-moving reservoir, and that oil in that free-moving reservoir uh, would have been under la both landowner A's property and landowner B's property. And because it was a, a, a liquid and was a free-moving reservoir, when landowner A pulled that oil out of the ground, landowner B would have lost a resource in the process. And what compulsory pooling did was allow landowner B to be compensated for that resource that was lost. They would receive um, royalties um, even though they were not the um, party that extracted the oil from the ground. So compulsory pooling was a protective measure for landowner B. And it's become a bit more of a contentious issue when it's been applied to hydraulic fracturing because um, things are very different when we talk about compulsory pooling with uh, hydraulic fracturing. Um, in, in this case, this diagram is indicating what compulsory pooling in um, an unconventional uh, natural gas situation might look like. So landowner A has put uh, a well in the ground, but because, as we mentioned earlier, the natural gas is trapped in shale rock, landowner A has to run a horizontal line um, uh, underground in order to access that natural gas in the shale rock and crack that shale rock and, and, and release the trapped natural gas. And so in this case, landowner A has actually had to go after the gas in landowner B's property rather than it, uh, the gas in landowner B's property coming to landowner A. And that raises a question about whether or not that's uh, a fair use of the compulsory pooling law, whether or not landowner B should essentially be forced to sell something to landowner A that they don't have to sell to landowner A. And, and so this is... Um, again, a, a fairly contentious issue, and, and this is what makes this issue contentious. It's, it's essentially the forced uh, selling of a, of a resource by landowner B to landowner, um, to land, through landowner A's actions. Um, so let's move on to some of the legislative and regulatory changes that are going to impact landowners, and um, we'll uh, touch a little bit more on split estates and forced pooling as we move through these. Um, so uh, again, turning to the 2012 legislation um, that passed around uh, hydraulic fracturing, uh, that's now known as Session Law 2012-143, and it passed in 2012. Uh, this legalized the processes involved in hydraulic fracturing, but prohibited permits until regulations um, were finalized. And the bill tasked the Mining and Energy Commission, or the MEC, with creating the regulatory structure to govern natural gas development, as well as other types of mineral gas and oil development in North Carolina. Um, some of the landowner protections that were put in place by the law, um, some of these we've mentioned already, but water usage, uh, leases had to state if water would be used and there had to be compensation provided. Um, the operator baseline uh, water testing was required uh, for wells within 5,000 feet of a wellhead. Um, there was presumed operator liability. Um, the uh, uh, gas operator, that is, is presumed responsible for contamination of water supplies within 5,000 feet of a wellhead. Again, um, these have changed, and we will touch on, on those changes. Um, and uh, the replacement water, um, 
also had to be provided, um, a, and it had to be an adequate in quantity and quality for the um, for a person's use um, if the uh, water supply had been uh, compromised during any process uh, involved in, in drilling. Additional protections, it said that uh, there was a 30-day notice required uh, for any land disturbing activities. Um, it said that the operator was liable for any damages resulting from the um, operator's activities. Um, it required that the operator be responsible for reclamation of the surface within uh, two years of completion and that a reclam reclamation bond would be required and uh, it required that landmen register with the state. Um, this was an effort to prevent fraud. This was so that landowners could verify that the person they were negotiating a lease with was who they say they are and they could essentially check up on them and see if they were a good actor in other states. Um, and again, the seven day right of rescission. So uh, we had a second piece of legislation related to oil and gas drilling and, and fracking uh, that passed in, in 2014. Uh, this is now known as Session Law 2014-4. Um, and that pre-approved the MEC regulations and it lifted the moratorium on permits in spring of 2015, which has now happened. Um, it required uh, uh, chemical disclosure. Um, uh, rules, it said that chemicals uh, must be disclosed unless protected by a trade secret law and that trade secret protected chemicals would be held with the state geologist. Uh, it said that presumed liability for uh, water contamination was going to be um, uh, reduced to a half mile radius from the wellhead. Um, this uh, is a reduction of the area of presumed liability by about 70%. Um, and it should be noted that this is a rebuttable presumption meaning the operator can challenge their liability and a landowner must be able to show a pretest of water resources that establishes a chain of custody. So it's very important that landowners uh, test their water supplies and be able to show that. Um, in fact, any contamination that showed up post drilling activities was the result of those drilling activities. Um, and then uh, well water testing. Uh, this piece of legislation actually shifted the burden of well water testing from the company onto the landowner. So the, the landowner must be responsible for uh, well water testing, except the companies would still have to pay a reasonable amount for that. Um, and that essentially reduces the effectiveness of the presumed liability statute. Um, because if the landowner doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't uh, pay for, um, or excuse me, not pay for, but conduct that, uh, that well water testing, then uh, it's much more difficult for that presumed liability um, to, uh, to really work in the landowner's favor. Um, additionally, there was uh, the creation of the North Carolina Oil and Gas Commission and Mining Commission. Uh, the North Carolina Oil and Gas Commission um, uh, this summer was set to uh, sort of take over from the Mining and Energy Commission um, and, and there is some complicating uh, factors around that, that that I'll discuss briefly um, in a few slides. Um, there was a preemption of local ordinances um, and it repealed any local ordinances that essentially um, uh, dealt with the siting of wells or prohibited fracking or placed any restriction or condition on oil and gas exploration. Um, there was a notice of uh, initial exploration. This was a 30-day notice prior to initial exploration or development um, that must be provided to the lessor. And additional study of forced pooling. Um, Diener uh, was directed to uh, study the final MEC rules concerning drilling units, spacing requirements, setbacks, and other rules that would impact forced pooling. Um, and that study was required by uh, October of 2015. So MEC rules, um, uh, the MEC again is the Mining and Energy Commission and this is the commission um, uh, within the Department of Environment and Natural Resources that was to write the regulatory structure that would govern natural gas development in North Carolina. Um, there were more than 120 rules developed uh, to govern the fracking process. Um, these rules cover everything from permitting to land reclamation and all, all in between. Um, the entire set of rules can be found at the Department of Environment and Natural Resources website, at this tiny URL that's on the screen right now. Um, and the MEC uh, held a public comment session on the draft rules um, that took place between July 15, uh, 
and September 30, uh, 2014. And there was, there was quite extensive public comment on those rules and some changes made as a result of those comments. So what are some of the key MEC rules for landowners that you might need to know? Um, one would be setbacks. Um, it would be important to look at and know what the setback regulations are, uh, particularly setbacks from occupied dwellings. They required 650-foot setback for any um, uh, drilling infrastructure uh, from an occupied dwelling. Um, there are variances that are allowed, um, and those variances um, could put uh, a drilling structure within 400 feet of an occupied dwelling. Um, bonding requirements, it, it may be uh, important for landowners to look into the bonding requirements. Uh, MEC rules currently require bonding before drilling commences um, rather than before any surface activities commence. Um, and the MEC does have authority to change this. Um, uh, rather, I guess the Oil and Gas Commission at this point does have authority to change this. Um, and uh, maybe one that uh, the Oil and Gas Commission should uh, should take a look at. Um, uh, for drilling units, uh, drilling units will include roughly 640 acres. This is the national standard, but uh, it's not explicitly stated in the rules. Um, there's a 30-day public notice required before drilling unit applications are heard uh, by the Oil and Gas Commission. Um, and it will require that surface use agreements uh, be in place before the application is approved, um, which is a, a good protective measure to have in place. Um, and then related to trade secrets, um, a request for trade secret protection includes a requirement for an affidavit stating chemicals for which a protection is sought are not regulated under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Standards or National uh, Secondary Drinking Water uh, Standards Acts. So there's some of the, just some of the, the rules that you, you might want to take a look at as a landowner um, so that you can uh, be sure that uh, companies in which you are dealing with are, are operating um, within some of the standards that are, that are supposed to directly protect you as a landowner. Um, so what's up to end result? We've mentioned this uh, several times, um, but forced pooling uh, is an issue that's left unresolved in North Carolina. Currently, this is legal in North Carolina, um, again, uh, but we have no statutory language or rules instructing the state as to how forced pooling should happen. Um, and legislation is probably needed to clarify uh, that forced pooling should not be used to create uh, fracking drilling units. Um, uh, and split estates. Um, split estates still exist in many North Carolina counties. In some cases, subsurface owners are unaware that they own the subsurface. And there is legislation needed to unify these dormant mineral estates. Um, and uh, uh, Ted Fitzsands is, is going to be able to provide a lot of additional uh, detail about that. He's, he's quite an expert in that issue. And the uh, status of the Oil and Gas Commission is, is somewhat in question right now. Uh, the governor is making a legal challenge um, of appointments to the Oil and Gas Commission that is uh, currently pending. Um, and these challenges leave in question uh, both the status of the existing rules and future appointments to uh, commissions uh, that fall under the uh, purview of this uh, pending lawsuit. Uh, so finally, how, how can you as uh, a citizen uh, of North Carolina get involved in some of these issues? Um, there are a few tips that um, that I have to offer. One is to uh, call your members in the General Assembly at least once during the legislative session. Um, we're still uh, uh, in the midst of uh, the 2015 uh, legislative session and you know sending emails are great, sending letters are great, but there's really no substitute for picking up the phone and calling uh, your member's office. Um, you can really have an outsized impact by expressing your opinion uh, by telephone and, and talking to somebody in your member's office. Um, you can also speak at an oil and gas commission meeting. Um, the only thing that works better than phone calls or in-person meetings um, is really you know, meeting with decision makers uh, that need to hear your story. Um, and you can sign up for emails at the uh, listserv that's on the screen there, diener.shale.gas at list.ncmail.net. Um, and then finally, um, talk to uh, your friends and your neighbors uh, about these issues. It's, um, it may be something that impacts your friends and neighbors, um, and, and they may not be aware of it. Um, and talk about it often. Um, I hear that um, generally people need to hear something five times before they really remember it. 
Um, so have conversations frequently with your uh, friends and neighbors, and um, hopefully this will uh, all be information that becomes uh, sort of second nature to uh, North Carolina landowners and can all be used uh, to help protect themselves when, when dealing with oil and gas companies and making decisions about their property. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ted Fitzsands with the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at North Carolina State University. Take it away, Ted. Thank you, James. Uh, this slide has my uh, contact information. Uh, please feel uh, free to uh, contact me. As I said before, I do not provide private legal advice, and I want to emphasize that before you sign a lease or you make a uh, sale of your mineral or oil and gas rights or before you buy uh, property from which the estate severed, there is no substitute for uh, legal advice from your uh, from a private attorney that you have retained. Next slide. So it's fundamental in North Carolina and most other states that the subsurface is capable of being severed from the surface and indeed the subsurface interest can be divided into more than one interest. For example, in uh, some areas of the country where you have more than one hydrocarbon bearing deposit, the two uh, can be uh, leased separately uh, by putting uh, depth limitations in the uh, lease. Uh, next. We also have uh, leases that are solely for coal bed methane. It's possible to lease the uh, minerals or sell the minerals separate from the oil and gas. And sand and natural gravel deposits, as distinguished from crushed rock, are in North Carolina most likely part of the uh, surface interest, and so those can be sold separately as well. Next. There is a presumption when you buy a piece of property that the surface estate includes the subsurface rights. That said, it's a rebuttable presumption, meaning that if evidence in terms of documents are brought forward, uh, and the document, the best document, of course, is a deed granting the uh, rights to the subsurface that uh, the, uh, the, it can then be proven that the estate is severed. But without evidence to the contrary, you own uh, everything from the surface down to the middle of the earth. Next. When we look at uh, interests that have been transferred, it's important to look at the intent of the parties and look at what is in um, conveyances. I've looked at quite a few deeds and there's a good deal of variation in terms of what's stated, particularly with uh, deeds that predate the development of oil and gas. Uh, you would not expect them to mention oil and gas, and their real questions arise as to whether or not uh, they include the oil and gas. And in North Carolina, it's not uncommon to find deeds for mineral rights that are more than 150 years old. I want to distinguish a deeded right from a lease. A lease does not transfer the ownership interest in the oil, gas, or minerals that have not been severed. So when a landowner leases their rights, they continue ownership of the resource until the point that it's actually severed. In the case of gas or, or oil, until it comes out of the well. In the case of minerals, until it's taken out of the, uh, out of the ground. Uh, leasehold interest uh, is a, in legal terms, is known as a chattel real, which is a type of intangible personal property. All of this has bankruptcy implications because if the owner of 
the mineral estate files for bankruptcy, that mineral uh, estate is also part of the bankruptcy estate. It's part of the property of the bankruptcy. And it's subject to distribution to the uh, creditors. If, the, if there's a lease, the lease is a type of intangible personal property that's, in this case, uh, um, property that you can't see or touch. It's like stocks and bonds. Uh, all you can see with the stocks and bond is a representation of it. The actual stock or bond is nothing physical that uh, that you can touch. And so the leasehold interest will be part of the bankruptcy, but because the ownership of the oil, gas, and minerals remains with the landowner, the underlying assets are not part of the uh, bankruptcy of the person that holds the lease. And that uh, that can be important in the event that a uh, gas or oil company fails. And we've seen a number of gas and oil companies that have filed for bankruptcy recently because of uh, the historically low prices. Uh, next. There's been discussion about what shale gas is from a legal perspective in North Carolina because shale is actually in the rock as opposed to in a uh, pool where you pump it out. It has to be, it has to be uh, forced out of the rock through the hydraulic fracturing process. But I think the best view is that it's probably covered uh, by the term natural gas rather than by the term uh, mineral. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there's a rebuttable presumption that natural gas is not included in a grant of the mineral estate. So remember going back to a previous slide, what is transferred depends on the intent of the grantor, that's the person transferring the uh, interest. But the presumption in the absence of evidence to the contrary is that natural gas is not included in the mineral estate. We do not have a uh, judicial decision on point in North Carolina, but my expectation is that we'll follow the same rule. But again, it's still an open question. When we talk about the law in North Carolina, it's important to remember that we do not and have never had an oil and gas industry in North Carolina because we have never had an oil and gas industry in North Carolina. There has never been an appellate judicial decision defining uh, these rights. So should there be a commercial development we could expect someday to see that litigation in those cases. And so that makes it difficult for an attorney to make definitive statements about a particular grant in a deed unless the resource is specifically named. So if natural gas is specifically named in the deed, then you know that was transferred or reserved as the case may be. Reserved means it wasn't transferred. So you could transfer the uh, minerals and reserve the uh, gas and oil. And that means that the original uh, landowner keeps those as part of the estate, but transfers the, but severs the uh, minerals, the mineral part of the estate. Let's go to the next, please. Evidence of what I just said is that the Mining Act of 1971 does not include oil and gas within the definition of minerals and that we have a separate Oil and Gas Conservation Act that suggests that was the intent of the General Assembly to treat oil and gas separately from minerals. Next. It's also worth noting that an interest in the subsurface can be insured, it can be used as security for a loan. That is, it can be uh, mortgaged or subject to a deed of trust, provided you find a uh, lender that is willing to loan money with that as security. In all probability, you will not. <laughs> 
the reason for that is is the resource that uh, we have in North Carolina is just that it is a resource it is not a reserve the difference between a reserve and a resource is that a resource is something that you know contains something of value in this case hydrocarbons oil and gas it is not a reserve because no commercial production has begun and so it remains unproven whether it can be extracted in commercial quantities so without an industry uh, developing you don't have any of uh, uh, what are generally referred to as proven reserves uh, next It's also a question about rights to sand and gravel that I've already mentioned and it's not clear that sand and gravel are part of the mineral estate. Let me distinguish natural gravel from crushed rock. Natural gravel is created by the action of water and is found in alluvial deposits farther north. It's created by glaciers and found in glacial deposits. Crushed rock is taking solid rock from the, from the uh, ground and crushing it uh, into a size that it can be used. Uh, the rock from which crushed rock is made is clearly part of the mineral estate. Uh, next. In most oil and gas states, the subsurface estate is dominant, meaning the owner of the subsurface has rights superior to the owner of the surface. Uh, uh, except to the extent that statutory law defines the relationship otherwise. There is some case law in North Carolina to suggest that the surface estate is dominant. However, North Carolina applies a rule of uh, reasonableness. So a company extracting gas is allowed to use the surface to the extent reasonable. So for example, it's probably not reasonable to uh, bulldoze an occupied residence in order to put in a uh, drilling pad. On the other hand, where you have an unoccupied or abandoned residence, uh, that might be uh, reasonable if there's uh, no other more reasonable place to place the drilling pad. So in any event, the owner of the subsurface is allowed to make reasonable use of the uh, surface that's owned by somebody else. Uh, in determining what's reasonable, we look to the accepted and prevailing methods of mining or oil and gas extraction. We look at the uh, deed or other instrument that created the interest to see if any particular rights were waived or reserved. In the case of uh, leases, we might, we would definitely look at the lease to determine whether or not the lease allows any use of the surface. And if it does, what limitations are placed on the uh, use of the surface. And in a well-drafted lease that provides adequate protection to a landowner, those uh, reservations can be quite detailed. They may, for, they would certainly protect uh, structures. Uh, if the if there are fences on the farm, they might protect fences and require that uh, fences be uh, repaired and maintained if they're damaged by the gas extraction. Uh, or exploration operation. Uh, most likely, North Carolina law protects residences and residential water supplies. Uh, there's case law to this effect even before the General Assembly uh, provided some protection for uh, water supplies in the statutes and legislation that uh, James discussed previously. Another question is whether there's right to compensation for surface damages. 
Uh, certainly there's a statutory right, again, in recent legislation passed by the General Assembly that uh, that James discussed. That's a fairly limited right. Uh, if you go beyond what the statute uh, allows, the question is, is there a common law right? And there's some evidence in the case law that there is. Uh, you could also create a right to compensation for surface damages in the lease. The lease can specifically provide for compensation uh, for surface damages. And if it's in the lease, it prevails over the common law and statutory law uh, to the extent that it's greater than required by statute or the common law. Next. Extinguishment is a interesting issue. We actually have 10 separate enactments by the General Assembly that uh, purport to extinguish ancient mineral rights and gas and oil rights. They require the counties to take uh, certain steps to accomplish this. That, is, that includes advertising for four successive weeks in the paper of legal record. Uh, and at this date, it may be difficult to prove that a county did that because you actually have, the, have to find the records that they did that. And those records generally are not online. Um, the subsurface can be subject to adverse possession. Adverse possession is sometimes known as squatter's rights. So if somebody starts pumping somebody else's gas without permission, that's a trespass uh, to extent that the pipes actually extend under the, uh, the uh, other landowner's property. And I'm going to talk about uh, what happens if the gas simply moves to the pipe, but the pipe's not under somebody else's property. That's governed by the rule of capture, which I'll talk about shortly. So if somebody starts pumping your gas and they pump it for the statutory period, generally more than 20 years, but there's some different rules for different circumstances, so this is more complex than I'm going into now, then they actually own the gas, although they don't have clear title to it. So it behooves a uh, resource owner to promptly bring a trespass action to stop extraction of their resource because you can in fact lose the right to the resource if you don't do that. The law requires that uh, mineral oil and gas rights be listed for um, ad valorem tax purposes, that's property tax purposes. The failure to list and pay taxes on the mineral estate will not extinguish those rights. The only two ways that they can be extinguished is by the county bringing a tax foreclosure action, which never happens because it's not cost effective for the county at least not with oil and gas, where uh, we have a resource but not a reserve, and therefore we can't put any reasonable value on it. Um, the North Carolina Marketable Title Act makes um, mineral rights an exception to ex the uh, normal extinguishment within 30 years for property that's not listed for taxes. So there's there's no effective extinguishment except through one of these 10 statutes. And again, that extinguishment only occurred at one point in time. It's not ongoing as the extinguishment in the uh, Marketable Title Act where anything that's older than 30 years is automatically extinguished if it uh, meets the uh, criteria in the Marketable Title Act, one of which is not being listed for taxes. Next. These laws included a two-year grace period, which is long since passed. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but there were certain things that an owner could do to avoid um, extinguishment. And none of these statutes applied to um, subsurface interests that were listed for taxation. Next. <clears throat> 
already mentioned uh, if the county didn't publish the notice or if you can't find copies of the notice, you may be out of luck as far as proving extinguishment. The statute also did not apply to owners who were under a disability. That's either under the age of 18 or if it was an earlier period under the age of 21 before the age of majority was lowered to uh, 18 or somebody who uh, uh, is mentally incompetent, uh, either adjudicated incompetent by a court or uh, can be proven subsequently to be incompetent because they don't have the ability to uh, respond to avoid extinguishment. Next. Uh, there's a uh, U.S. Supreme Court case that uh, has held that, uh, looking at Indiana's law, has held that extinguish these these interests is constitutional. It is not a uh, a uh, uncompensated taking under uh, uh, the Fifth Amendment, for which uh, the property owner can seek con uh, uh, compensation. Uh, and that's based on the owner's failure to take affirmative steps to protect their property interests. Um, there is a North Carolina case law that's contradictory as to whether these extinguishment statutes are constitutional. So again, another uncertainty, and this is a great deal of uncertainty in the law governing oil and gas in North Carolina for the simple reason that we've never had an oil and gas industry, and therefore we've never had any litigation and appellate decisions about, uh, about these issues. Next. Another possible way to extinguish these interests, although again it hasn't been tested in court, is uh, by registration of the uh, property under uh, the general statutes uh, 43-1 and, and uh, subsequent uh, parts of the statute in that section. This is sometimes known as the Torrin system. But we have very little property in North Carolina registered under the Torrin system. But it is another option that a uh, landowner could use for uh, extinguishing ancient mineral rights. Next. It's very difficult to abandon mineral rights. Uh, the lapse of time is insufficient. Non-payment of property taxes is insufficient. The failure to list for property taxes is insufficient. It requires an unequivocal act or acts of abandonment. So the owner has to say, I abandon them, uh, which is very rare. Next. Talked about adverse possession. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much more about them, except to say that the adverse possession of the surface where you have a severed estate does not result in the adverse possession of the mineral rights. However, if the mineral rights have never been severed, then the adverse possession of the surface includes the adverse possession of the mineral rights. Um, next. Actual mining is required to establish adverse possession of the mineral rights. It is not necessary to mine all of the possible types of minerals available. Uh, producing one is sufficient. It is not clear whether if you uh, mine a mineral, say um, titanium, if the adverse possession of the, of the uh, titanium would confer adverse possession of the oil and gas. Again, there's no appellate decision on point. Next. Let's talk about conveyancing. By conveyancing, we mean by selling the subsurface interest. The rule of caveat emptor generally applies with some recent statutory exemptions where the General Assembly has required that, it is, that uh, certain uh, aspects of uh, 
the mineral rights be added to the disclosure statements that's required for real property transactions. But generally, it's up to the party buying the property to make a determination. There has to be a covenant that the person selling the rights actually owns them, and this can result in liability coming back on the, uh, the um, seller if it's subsequently proven that they didn't own them. There have been some sad cases in Pennsylvania where, and this rule applies to leases as well as sales, where the uh, person leasing guaranteed that they own the uh, the uh, gas rights, and it was later proven that they didn't, and they had to pay all of that uh, money back to the uh, leasing company. And if they'd already paid taxes on it, and the three-year statute of limitations for filing an amended return uh, had had lapsed, then they pay the gross amount they receive back to the uh, company that leased the uh, rights and not accounting for the uh, taxes they paid and they can't get that back. Uh, it can be financially devastating. Um, in terms of determining whether we have a lease or a sale, and you may be thinking that that's obvious, and most of the time it is, but there are people who are unclear in their language, and it's not always certain. So we look to the substance of the transaction, not the form. If it looks like a sale, it's a sale. If it looks like a lease, it's a lease, even though, la even though sale language was used. Uh, the statute of fraud applies to uh, sales and leases of mineral rights in oil and gas. That means that sales and leases of mineral rights in oil and gas must be in writing and signed by the parties. Next. So some questions to consider in engaging in this is, uh, were the uh, mineral or oil and gas rights ever transferred? If they were transferred, what were the rights transferred? And were the rights, if transferred, ever relinquished, abandoned, or transferred back? And if not, were the rights ever extinguished under one of the 10 extinguishment statutes? Those are questions that landowners need to answer for themselves with the assistance of their attorney before they enter into this process. Next. Mineral rights can be condemned. Where you don't have a severed estate, a condemnation condemns the whole thing. Where you do have a severed estate, a uh, separate action has to be maintained against the owner of the uh, mineral rights. And the minerals are a factor in valuation. Although, as I've said earlier, valuing gas rights in North Carolina is difficult because we never had an industry. Next. Uh, these rights are also subject to a partition action, uh, meaning that where you have the rights owned as undivided interest by tenants in common, uh, that uh, one owner of an undivided interest in the mineral rights can sue the other uh, owners and ask a court to divide the rights. That can be a physical division or more likely, the judge will order the rights sold and, trans and uh, divide up the proceeds. And that division is based on each uh, owner's respective percentage share in the mineral rights. Next. The true value method that's used for all real estate is used for valuation. This is a statutory method. Again, where there's no proven reserve, it is difficult to value this because we don't know when or ever it will uh, ultimately be uh, extracted next. So let's talk about evaluating oil and gas lease proposals. This is really an important process for landowners. And the failure to do this adequately has caused great difficulties for some landowners. And this is a long-term lease. If resource extraction begins under an oil or gas lease, 
it is very likely that the lease will last well beyond the uh, life of the uh, landowner who signed the lease. Uh, next, so you got to do due diligence. Uh, who are you dealing with? Recognizing, of course, that the lease may be sold. Uh, is this a very small company that's thinly funded, or is this a big company with excellent funding? Uh, this is important for evaluating the risk that you may not be paid the money that you're due, uh, or that the company may go into bankruptcy. Next. Are you dealing with the, a principal? That means the company that's actually going to do the exploration and the resource extraction. Or are you doing with, dealing with a broker who works on commission to put together a block of properties? Next. A bro uh, dealing with a broker or the principal, um, both can be acceptable. But one of the things you need to know if you're dealing with the principal is what is their financial condition. If they're publicly traded, that's uh, easy to find out. If they're not publicly traded, it can be far more difficult to determine the company's financial condition. Next. What is the safety and environmental compliance record if the co of the company if you're dealing with a principal? The safety and environmental compliance record varies substantially from one company to another. There are very good companies in this industry that do an excellent job, and there are companies in this industry that do an abysmally poor job. And obviously, you don't want to sign a lease with one of the latter. And in general, you can go to the states where they operate and look at the state regulatory agency, and you can find these statistics. Next, what is their litigation history? Do they have a history of taking the landowners they've leased from to court? Uh, and that gives you, uh, or do they often get sued by the landowners they lease from? Uh, both of those are red flags that suggest that you should get more information because you may be getting yourself in a situation that will be difficult. Next. Are they registered to do business in North Carolina? Every company that does business in North Carolina is required to register with the North Carolina Secretary of State. And I've given you their website there. You can go to the website and you can check. If they are not registered to do business in North Carolina, they are not legally operating in North Carolina, and you should not do business with them. Next. So let's go on with the leasing process. Next. You will probably be told when you're approached by a landman, and a landman is a uh, person, they may be a commission agent or they may be an employee of the principal, whose job is to go out and solicit leases. And I should add as a side note that landman is a term we use. I have a daughter of a cousin of mine who is a landman. She uh, leases land for the company she works for. She works for a for a principal as an employee, and she's still a landman. Uh, it's just the term that's used in the industry. Many uh, landmen will tell you that they're presenting the, you as the landowner with a standard lease. There is no such thing. That is the standard lease that that company uses, and you can rest assured that it is favorable to the company. It is not favorable to the landowner. Now, that said, the better companies will provide a lease that is relatively fair. Uh, the worst companies will provide a standard lease uh, that is horribly unfair. You cannot get through this process without hiring a private attorney to help you. That is problematic in North Carolina because we do not have an oil and gas bar in North Carolina. There are a few attorneys that have experience from other states, but they're few and far between. So your best bet is to find an attorney uh, 
in your community who regularly handles commercial real estate transactions and they are probably probably your best bet next your lawyer will generally take the standard lease and rather than attempting to provide it line by line your attorney will prepare what we call the landowner addendum and that is an addendum to the lease presented by the company or the broker and it has the terms and changes that you and your attorney have decided to ask for and you have to understand you'll probably go back and forth several times on this next I can't emphasize this enough the lease is governed by what is in within the four corners of the document oral statements made in the process of negotiation are irrelevant to the relationship into which the landowner is entering absolutely irrelevant and difficult to prove I should add as well it is possible to have a fraud occur uh, that a court would recognize as setting aside the written agreement however that is it is almost never provable to a court that those statements were made and needless to say the party that made those statements will deny them so what you've got is what's in black and white in print in the lease and you have nothing more and nothing less so keep that in mind don't pay any attention to the oral representations because they're irrelevant to the relationship that you have once you have leased your uh, gas or oil rights or your mineral rights next talk about some of the beginning issues next do you own the resource to be leased are you the sole owner of it you have a spouse that has an interest in the uh, property and your spouse always has an interest in the property if you're married and you will have to have your uh, spouse's signature on the lease what are you going to lease are you leasing the entire property uh, next are you providing water under the terms of the lease generally probably in the North Carolina Piedmont that's probably a bad idea because we don't have a lot of spare water in the North Carolina Piedmont if you are providing water are you getting paid separately for it uh, as a general rule you should next what do you plan to do with the land in the future is the lease compatible with those uses if you plan to build your dream home on this the only spot on the property where a drilling pad can be placed then your future uses of land are incompatible there are many agricultural and forestry uses that are incompatible with uh, gas extraction depending on the size and shape of the property and so on and the extent to which the uh, surface is needed to extract the resource so there's no statement that one can make do this or do that you have to look at each piece of property separately each landowner separately because each piece of property is unique and each landowner has their own plans for the property next so let's talk about some of the clauses you're likely to see in the uh, standard lease next choice of law that had best be North Carolina if another law is picked um, it may not be it may be a, it may that contract provision may be invalid under North Carolina law but in any case if the choice of law is anything other than uh, North Carolina that is a big red flag uh, that you should uh, they should give you a warning as you're doing your due diligence next the choice of forum or venue is the court where the dispute is to be decided 
if it is any court other than the Superior Court in the North Carolina County where the property is located, that is a huge red flag. Uh, and you should be very cautious about entering such a, such a lease, and your attorney will probably advise you not to. Next. Um, before I... Uh, uh, go to go on to this. I should also add that the lease may contain an arbitration or mediation clause. And arbitration is where a person makes a neutral third party makes a decision in the dispute between the landowner and the party leasing the land. One has to be very careful about that because one needs to look at how the arbitrator is selected, where the arbitration is to occur, what law the arbitration is to proceed under. Is it North Carolina law or is it the law of some other state? Uh, so arbitration can look attractive, but one has to be cautious because it may actually be more expensive than going to court and it may be very disadvantageous to the landowner depending on the formula used for selecting the arbitrator. Mediation on the other hand is simply an attempt to reach an agreement on the part of the parties using a neutral third party, but a mediator will not force an agreement on the landowner, and that is quite different than arbitration. Um, does your uh, lease contain an attorney fees clause? That is, if it does go to court, the losing side pays the attorney fees and court costs of the winning side. Is this a one-sided attorney fees clause? That is a uh, heads I win, tails you lose clause. Does it is it set up so that if you sue the company that leased your land and you win, you don't get attorney fees, but if you lose, you pay attorney fees. That's very unfair, and again, that's a huge red flag. That's something for your uh, attorney to go to negotiate out of the uh, ultimate agreement before it's signed. Next, talked about arbitration clause, but it's, again, it's useful to emphasize who pays, uh, how is the arbitrator to selected. Those are key questions. Where does the arbitration occur? Next. So let's talk about some of the terms of the lease agreement. Who are the parties? Well, that's important. As I said, you may be dealing with a broker who's ultimately going to transfer or assign this lease to somebody else. So that's important. You obviously have to have all of the owners of the property involved. And in North Carolina, we uh, have a significant amount of air property. That's property that uh, was not probated uh, generally, usually not probated. And the result is you have multiple uh, uh, owners of undivided interests in the property. All of those owners have to be a party to the lease agreement. Next. The property description is very important. If you are not leasing the entire property for gas production, that needs to be stated and there needs to be a legally adequate description of what you're leasing in the lease. Next. How long does the lease agreement last? The exploration phase, that's the phase of the lease before any production begins, generally shouldn't be more than three to five years. We've seen some leases as long as 20 years, but the longer that phase is, the longer your property remains tied up without your earning income, but you can't, uh, you can't uh, sell it or, uh, or uh, develop it because it's tied up with this lease. Next. Um, there we have two terms. I've referred to the primary term, which is the exploratory term, and that should be three to five years. Uh, next. The secondary or production term can continue as long as gas and oil 
or oil are being produced. Uh, one should take care with this to see how uh, uh, production is defined. Uh, there's some uh, deceptively drafted leases out there that define a production in a way that uh, you're not actually producing any gas, but you are considered producing for purposes of the lease continuing. Uh, that's not something you want. Uh, you can simply negotiate a uh, payment when the wells are uh, closed in, that is, that they have been, they're not producing currently. But uh, if uh, the lease is continuing, you should be getting paid. So that's an important item to look at. And uh, these these uh, clauses get very technical, and they absolutely require the uh, assistance of a of an attorney. Uh, next. So what are the uh, payment terms? Uh, how how do you uh, how do you go about uh, uh, getting uh, paid? So you need to look at that. Uh, next, do you get a signing bonus? As uh, James said earlier, these have been before the recession uh, twenty thousand dollars or more in a few cases. The leases that were signed in North Carolina, the bonus payments that we saw ranged between one and four dollars, which is not much money. So, and, and some of the difference is legitimate because, again, there are no proven reserves in North Carolina, so that greatly diminishes the uh, value. Uh, next. Sometimes there'll be a provision to extend that exploratory period. Uh, the lease should provide for delay rental payments. Those are rental payments for the amount of delay of getting into production and you as the landowner getting royalties. Uh, next, royalty payments are what uh, you get from the uh, the uh, sale of the uh, gas. These need to be, the terms of these need to be examined carefully. What is the and it's there have been a few uh, landowners who unfortunately looked only at the percentage and didn't look at the fine print for what's deducted from the uh, gross payment that the company receives. And there have been cases where the landowner got nearly nothing because of the uh, deduction. Obviously, those were situations where they did not retain an attorney. Um, next. Uh, Shut-in royalty payments are like uh, delay of rental payments, except that they occur after production's begun and production has subsequently ceased. Uh, so you should be getting royalty payments when the gas production's not occurring. And this will happen because prices are low or for other reasons there's uh, inadequate space in the interstate pipeline to carry the gas to markets. Uh, any number of reasons for shutting down production, but you as a landowner should be getting payments for that. Uh, next, we often see free natural gas provisions, so you get a portion of the uh, natural gas produced. Those are only useful if you uh, have a use for the gas and you need to evaluate whether you would be better off simply selling all the gas and buying the uh, energy that you need elsewhere. Next. So what are the rights granted by the landowner? What uh, surface use is included? What limitations? It's important to be very specific. If there's going to be an access road, there should be a uh, adequate uh, description, preferably a legal description, that states where the access roads to go, where are pipelines to go, uh, are the uh, pipelines, and these are the feeder pipelines going from the, uh, the uh, wells and ultimately connecting with an interstate pipeline. Are the uh, 
the uh, gas pipes below plow depth so you can plow over it if it's agricultural land. The process of disturbing the land is going to reduce the uh, production from that land because you have mixing of soil. It's a compensation for that. Let's go to the next slide and talk a bit about the uh, mineral estate. Um, the mineral estate is everything in the subsurface. And you go to the next. The surface estate is what it says, the surface. Um, next, water is a separate right. And it's worth uh, coming back to water because in North Carolina and other East Coast states, almost every stream of any size has been used for water power. And the rights to that water were often um, restricted in order to protect the grist mill uh, or lumber mill owner that was using the uh, water power. And very often in subsequent deeds, those restrictions weren't carried forward, but they're still valid, they're still applicable. So if you decide in your lease to provide water, you had better do a uh, title search to make sure that you actually have the right to provide that water, because you may not. Uh, next, we have something called a no surface rights lease. Uh, this is often used particularly for small parcels where there's not enough room for surface development and where there are adjoining larger tracks where the uh, infrastructure for uh, gas production can be placed. So this can be negotiated. It may well affect what you get paid. Next, uh, storage rights. Storage rights are the rights to store either waste from the fracking operation or natural gas. Uh, if you're going to grant storage rights, you should be paid for those, and that should be explicit in the lease. Next, so you have some feeder pipelines coming from the wells. Um, if you don't put a restriction in the lease, they can run, they being the gas production companies who say have a property leased uh, next to you or somewhat farther away if they have leased all the property. They may transport what's called foreign gas, that's gas from somebody else's property, over your property. Um, in addition to uh, pipelines, they're also going to be putting in power lines to power the equipment. You can agree to any of this in a lease, but if you do, you should be paid for it. Well, let's talk about some additional considerations. And let's go on uh, to the next one, to the rule of capture. So then we'll talk about the rule of capture. So the rule of capture says, I put down a well, and the bottom of that well, that the whole well is on my property. And I start pumping. And gas or oil moves from neighboring properties to my property. The rule of capture says that's mine. Now, if I actually stick a pipe under somebody else's property, that's a trespass. But if I'm just drawing on the oil or gas, that is not uh, a uh, trespass, which is why the next slide we have pooling or unitization. These terms are used somewhat synonymously in the statutes of different states. But the idea is because for conventional oil and gas, this resource moves that uh, the uh, that uh, everybody should be forced to share. Otherwise, we see an excessive number of wells put in, which is an inefficient use of resources. And uh, you know, we have a, you know, beggar thy neighbor. You put wells in right on your property line so you can pump your neighbor's gas. Well, the only way your neighbor can stop that in the absence of a pooling order is to sink a well next to you. And uh, that uh, is very disruptive of the surface and quite harmful to uh, surface owners as well as being inefficient. So states use pooling or unitization and force everybody to pool the revenue from 
properly spaced wells. It can also result in excessive pumping and uh, result in leaving more gas or oil in the ground than would be the case if you had appropriate well spacing. Next. Well, sometimes a company does something that causes damage to the neighbors. If you as a landowner are sued, who pays? And that's why we like to see an indemnification clause in a lease. So if the landowner is forced to pay as a result of, a, of a, an act of the uh, company extracting the gas or oil, then the company extracting the gas or oil will indemnify or pay the, uh, the landowner for what they paid for damage to a third party. Next, we occasionally see non-disclosure or confidentiality clauses in leases. There's very little reason for those and you should approach such a, uh, a clause as a red flag, talk about it with your attorney because if you do sign a lease with a non-disclosure clause, you really can't talk about anything in the lease. Next, the lease should include access to records and the right to production audits so you can make sure that you are being provided with what was promised in the lease. Next, well, taking the property out of a, probably an agricultural or a uh, forestry use and you probably had it in use value taxation, so you paid you paid tax on a valuation that's less than the fair market value. Oil and gas production are not agricultural and forestry, so the tax on the prop on the real property is going to be at the um, the um, higher valuation. And again, if you're successful in finding oil and gas, the value of the property probably goes up as well. So you can see a substantial increase in uh, real estate taxes. As far as the equipment on the property, that is taxed and listed separately uh, as personal property, and that's the responsibility of the uh, production company that owns the property. Next. There are in the North Carolina rules a severance tax that should be paid by the production company. Now it may figure into your formula for your uh, royalty, so those are not unrelated. Next, if you're going to lease your property, you don't want it tied up for a long time without producing income. So many leases have a clause requiring prompt development of the resource usually defined as prompt drilling. These are sometimes called drilling or development causes. Next. So what happens when it's all over? Well, you need a uh, removal or forfeiture of equipment clause so you can clean up the property. And ideally, you have a provision in the lease requiring the drilling company to uh, do that. Next already mentioned that sometimes these companies go into bankruptcy. You need a provision for project failure or termination and it would be a good idea to have a bankruptcy clause which means you may need to get that clause drafted by a bankruptcy attorney so you may need a second attorney in addition to the attorney that you have uh, drafting the overall lease. Um, it may be that one attorney can do that for you. You need to inquire about that. And then different attorneys have different training and experience. Next, I've already mentioned this, the insolvency or bankruptcy clause. Uh, next, uh, you have to have a provision for removal of equipment. Uh, next, uh, you should expect that the company developing the property has the property adequately insured and it would certainly be useful to, for the landowner to negotiate for the landowner to be a third party insured under that uh, insurance policy, meaning that if uh, there's uh, 
uh, injury to a neighbor, the production company's insurance pays rather than yours, so you don't uh, get an adverse insurance history and an increase in rates. Uh, you want proof of this, so you at least should provide that the company will, on a regular basis, provide you with a certificate of insurance. Uh, next, I've already mentioned taxes, but you need to look at the. You need to look also at if you are successful in this and you make money, how are you going to be taxed? And oil and gas revenue is taxed somewhat differently than uh, other income. So it's very important to uh, have a tax professional look at your tax situation and look at specifically to the, uh, the uh, rules for oil and gas, which are both different from the general income tax rules and uh, provide for uh, lower tax rates. So you don't want to end up having this tax as ordinary income because it's not. Next. The lease will be recorded. Uh, generally, you want the entire uh, lease recorded. And the reason you want the entire lease recorded, even though it's more expensive to do so, is 50 years from now, it's unlikely that your children or grandchildren are going to have a copy of the lease. And if they don't have a copy of the lease, they can't, re they can't enforce those beneficial provisions that you, uh, you um, required. So by recording the lease, you ensure that a uh, copy is available. And uh, that's what I have. I am going to turn it back to you, James. Ted, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate you offering all of that really good information. Um, that concludes uh, our webinar on oil and gas uh, leasing in North Carolina. Um, if you have questions for Ted um, or if you have questions for me, uh, our contact information is there on the screen. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with us anytime. Um, if you have general questions about this issue or you are um, trying to figure out whether or not uh, oil and gas uh, leasing may be uh, right for you as a landowner. Um, so thanks everybody, thanks for your participation, and um, we uh, uh, hope to uh, hear from you if you have questions. Thanks.